Hi, I'm Anjan, and I'm in 12th grade. I go to Brentwood School in Los Angeles, California. And this presentation is about the Zero One Test for Chaos, which is a revolutionary new test for determining chaos, chaotic behavior in dynamical systems. This project is for a math course I dual enrolled in this past fall at San Diego State University. The class, Discrete Dynamical Systems and Chaos, is intended for senior undergraduate students and first year graduate students, and was taught by Dr. Antonio Palacios. I researched and presented this originally with my classmate, Carl Kaler. So the first thing I'll do is, what is a dynamical system? What do models that model um, the swing of a pendulum, climate systems, and disease spread all have in common? What they have in common is that they can be modeled in systems that vary with time. And what is chaos? Chaos is what's known as deterministic, which means its next step depends on its current value. And there's a set of rules guiding how the system develops over time. So on the outside, it may appear unpredictable and seemingly random, but on the inside, as I said, there's a rule, there's a set of equations taken like clockwork, determining how the system progresses. So the three main principles of chaos are a system being nonlinear, extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, and cause and effect not being proportional. So the most important one of these is extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And Edward Lorenz, in the 60s when he coined the term chaos, he was modeling weather, and he found that if he truncated um, a numerical value to three, um, three decimal places after zero, he observed a wildly different value than if he left it at six digits after zero. So this is um, what you can think of as the butterfly effect. And if you've seen time travel movies, you're warned not to mess with anything in the past, as a really, really small difference could magnify into something really great, which is what chaos is all about. So chaos is not actually randomness. You may think of it as, you may um, hear it used as randomness in popular popular speech, but it's not actually randomness. So as I said before, chaos is deterministic. So this is what's called a Lorenz attractor. It's an example of a strange attractor. And it's actually deterministic. So the main principle is if you start anywhere and you go through an orbit where you iterate the system multiple times, you'll wind up somewhere in this, between, somewhere between these two attractors orbiting it. But you don't, the key is, you won't know exactly where you'll be. You can't, per, you can't start an orbit here and know exactly wh where you'll be in, say, 10, 20, or 100 iterates. And that's what chaos is about, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So you could have a point here and a point here that are very, very close together. And after 100 iterates, they may be, one may be here and one may be here. So it becomes very hard to predict in systems over a long period of time. So gas particle collisions is actually a random process. This is what's called a, st a stochastic model. So as gas expands in a room, the particles hit each other in a purely random fashion. There's no underlying equation determining how they collide and interact with each other. So a really good example of chaos is predicting epidemic spread, So, in which would be particularly useful in COVID. So this model is from May of 2020. And the key part in disease forecasting is when we do it with current models or diseases that we know how they spread, like the flu, we know what values to estimate. But with a new disease like COVID, we don't know exactly what's going to happen because we haven't dealt with it before. So what uh, alternative models use is they use chaos, especially in the case of Italy in March and April. Because when COVID goes to different countries, you don't know exactly how lethal the disease is and how quickly it's going to spread. So using chaos can actually help you make models without relying on underlying assumptions about how the disease is going to spread. So what is the zero one test for chaos? So the zero one test for chaos is actually a new revolutionary test for determining chaos. As we'll see, the other methods are actually very cumbersome and very difficult to implement. This is a very easy test to implement and it can determine chaos with great sensitivity while also being able to ignore noise, which you'll see is actually very useful. So the main goal is to adjust whether the trajectories of a system are bounded. So a very good application of chaos um, zero one test for chaos has been predicting heart attacks. So there's new research being done on this, but basically the major causes of heart attacks, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, are caused when the electrical impulses that uh, tell the heart when to beat in the ventricles become chaotic. So instead of synchronized pumping between the ventricles, you actually get spasms. So blood doesn't actually get pumped properly. And what an AED does is actually shocks the heart back into proper sinus rhythm. So what you could do is you could um, get a test of someone's heartbeat as it varies over time, which would be a dynamical system, and you could run the zero one test on it. And what you would get is it can tell you um, with an output whether or not your heartbeat is actually chaotic. 
So maybe it appears normal and regular, but in, um, it's actually chaos, and you could predict whether or not in the future this person may have a heart attack. So here's an example of heart arrhythmias. We have systolic versus diastolic pressure in model A. C is actually what's known as a cobweb plot. And D is a time series of a heart beating over time. So what are the benefits of the 0-1 test? So as I said earlier, it's a very simplified way to uh, de um, determine chaos in a dynamic system. So the main benefit is there's no phase space reconstruction required. You can tell you the same result as a maximal Lyapunov of exponent would without you having to linearize your data. And the best part is you can apply it directly to the output of the system without having to run it on the underlying um, equation of the system. And because of this, it's got a, um, a large amount of applications in all fields from astrophysics to economics to even political science. So the process. You input your one-dimensional time series into the test. You calculate a time average mean squared displacement. From this, you calculate your growth rate. And from this, you'll get a value of k, which tells you if your system is bounded and hence regular dynamics or linear and diffusive, indicating, uh, indicating chaotic behavior. So this is the results of the test. You can either get a k-value of 0 or close to 0, which we'll see in later examples, or a k-value of 1, which indicates the, there is chaotic, the underlying dynamics are chaotic. So another popular method for chaos is um, detecting chaos is called phase space reconstruction. And what phase space reconstruction does is you construct a coordinate system corresponding to the dimension of your system. And this is pretty cumbersome and hard to do. And, the zero, and using the zero one test, you don't actually have to do this. Um, the Lyapunov exponent, you may have heard of it. It's named after Alexander Lyapunov, a 19th century Russian mathematician who worked on fluid dynamics. And it does require phase space reconstruction, also linearization. So basically, this tests for sensitive dependence on initial conditions. If you have two initial points who are arbitrarily close, how fast are they going to diverge as the system undergoes multiple iterates? So basically, maybe on the first iterate, they're very, very close to, um, to each other. The first iterate, they move further apart. And the second iterate, they're much, much farther apart. So that's really, the, that's really the underlying theme of chaos. These two points may appear really, really close, but after a certain number of iterates, their orbits might diverge wildly, which is what this tells you. Another method is called topological conjugacy. So basically, you establish what's called an isomorphism, which is a structure preserving transition, um, translation and basically, this is um, the a very popular example of chaos. It's called a logistic map. And it's basically a negative valued quadratic function. And this is a tent map. So what you'll see here is this is 0.5. And basically, you'll see this is linear. And on this side is linear. So calculating the Lyapunov exponent for this, um, for this is actually quite easy. It's ln of 2. And the problem here is it's curved. So you're going to have to linearize your data. So what you can actually do is establish an isomorphism with this map. So you see the symbolic dynamics for this line up with this. And basically what the symbolic dynamics are is if you start off here, it tells you that after three iterates, you'll end up in the left half of the system. While here, for the second two, you'll end up in the left, but for the third, you'll be in the right side. So these two points may be very, very close to each other, but at some point, after three iterates, one is going to end up on this side, and one is going to end up on this side, which is chaos, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This actually has very, very similar symbolic dynamics, so you can actually use it in place of this to study the dynamics for a certain value. So, now let's talk about the theoretical underpinnings of the zero-one test. So, we utilize the main principle called an extension morphism. So, we take a one-dimensional time series here, in blue, and we translate it to the two-dimensional Euclidean plane with the variables P and Q. So, basically, these blue outputs are MATLAB code that Carl and I worked on, and that's the output you'll be seeing in blue for the next couple slides. So now let's go look at the equations. So here's our algorithm. So we take our one-dimensional time series, and we obtain values of p and q. And if you notice the n plus 1 and n, that's a commonly used thing in dynamical systems. We're not using y and x. We're focusing on the iterate. So this is the nth iterate. This is the n plus 1th iterate. So basically, we have an equation 2, which is our time average mean squared displacement. So you'll notice here the squaring, and that is due to the fact that we just want to measure displacement. We don't care about what direction. And you'll notice j plus n and j here, and j plus n, j. So we're basically, we're measuring the distance with respect to each of the variables, and we're summing it up. And through this equation here, we obtain k, which is our growth rate, and the output, which you'll see, k equals 0 or k equals 1, which is the conclusion of our test and the ultimate output. So here is the code Carl and I worked on. And this is visualizing how we output the two-dimensional extension. 
So now let's talk about um, an example using the logistic map. So basically the structure of the logistic map here is we obtain the x n plus 1 iterate um, from these initial values of x plus n, which you know, is determinism basically, because as the value of xn uh, x plus 1 is outputted, that becomes the new xn, and then you get a new x pl n plus 1. So it's, there's not, it's not really a random process, this is the underlying equation. But the thing is, once you get to this region of chaos, it's hard to predict where the n plus 100th is going to end up based on initial values of n, which may be very, very close together and end up in wildly different places. So basically, we're going to tune the, how we focus on, how we, um, what you can, what a bifurcation diagram is, is we're basically going to tune this parameter r, and we're going to see the behavior here based on what value of r we've chosen. So basically, this red line is going to illustrate um, the corresponding output here for 2,000 different values of x. So basically, what happens is at this point of accumulation known as three, uh, which value is 3.57, the period doubling cascade ends and we enter a region of chaos. So, and you will notice here how there's stripes of white which indicate regions of stability, but for the purposes of this, the point we're studying 3.55 is part of the period doubling cascade, but it is not after 3.57, so it's not chaotic. So our output here, you'll notice, it's periodic. If you cut off a certain number of, if you focus on a certain number of iterates, those will repeat themselves. So, yeah. So it's not chaotic, as you saw in our other example. So if we look at the two-dimensional output, we get a bounded trajectory. And this is this is a two-dimensional Euclidean extension. It's not a phase space. So just because you know we see these lines crisscrossing, that doesn't mean it's chaotic. It's in a different um, phase space than the Lorenz attractor. So, but what you'll see here is in contrast to this never-ending series of squiggles, which you'll see in the next, next example for um, a, a, a value of R that, where our system turns chaotic, we get a nice bounded trajectory here. So we're, we're now going to focus on a point 3.97 here, which is in the region of chaos of the logistic map. So basically, as you can see here, those are one-dimensional time series output, which was generated using the math lab code. And you can see here how, you know, even just by inspection, you'll see how it's clearly chaotic. If I, you know, make a certain set of intervals, no matter which intervals I choose, they're not going to repeat themselves. So in contrast to the other one, where it's periodic, this is chaos. So this is our, two, this is our unbounded trajectory using the PQ algorithm. So this is the extension we get. So you see here how there's no repeating pattern. In our two-dimensional cleaning space, there is no repeating pattern. It is not a nice bounded circle, as we saw for a non-chaotic input value. These squiggles will never repeat themselves, no matter what intervals you choose, or how many iterates you go, they'll never repeat themselves. So, um, this is going to observe the logistic map for the parameters of R between 3.5 and 4. And what I want to highlight here is, until the point 3.57, um, 3 we'll see how our 0 and test will return a value of 0. And there's two main methods, the correlation and regression method. And basically, they correctly give you a value of k equals 0. And what I want to highlight is as soon as the um, system turns chaotic, our test will immediately jump up to k equals 1 and go through there. And you may see how it drops down briefly. That's for these brief regions of stability, which you'll see in these white lines devoid of the shading. And for this major one, around 3.8, you can see how it returns back to k equals 0. So I want to... Um, highlight here is how sensitive our test is and also how it's not fooled by period doubling cascades. So it's not fooled by the period doubling cascade here, it's k equals 0. It's not at point 0.4, it's not at point 0.3 or indeterminate values, it's right here at k equals 0 and it immediately jumps up to k equals 1. Alright, let's go over a few examples. So, this is the point care map and basically what this is is when you take a periodic orbit in the subspace of a continuous dynamical system which is slightly different than the discrete model we studied earlier of the logistic map, and you intersect it with a lower dimensional subspace. And Michael Henon, who you may have heard of for the Henon map in chaos, basically used this to study the orbit of stars in galaxies. Because if you don't, if you just output it, it looks like a tangled mess, but this actually simplifies the output and you can interpret it better. So basically what I want to highlight is for the region you see in blue, in dark blue, it's a k value of zero. And as you get further and further red, you get a k value um, of 1. And remember, k equals 1 equals chaotic dynamics. And k values of close to 0 correspond to regular dynamics. So you can see, you know, the regions of stability and regions of chaos for this two-dimensional map. 
What I want to highlight is how there's not actually a lot of intermediate colors. So you may see some stripes of orange, some stripes of green, but in contrast to the overall, most of the most of the colors are either defined as blue and red, which illustrates you know the the sense um, the sensitivity of our test and its accuracy as well. Okay, so this is the Schrodinger equation, and it's used in quantum mechanics. And basically, what I want to highlight here is how well our test deals. The zero one test deals with um, it can deal with fractional dynamics and also higher order partial differential equations. So reconstructing the phase space and calculating a Lyapunov exponent, linearizing this data would be very very complicated. But we'll just examine two different cases, tuned by this epsilon value, to show um, how you know distinctive our test is and how accurate it is as well. So as you can see, this is uh, illustrating regular dynamics for an epsilon value of 0 0.095, and our k value, as you can see, is just le is you know about um, 0 0.0017 away from zero. So it correctly tell assesses that this is regular dynamics, and for this one, which is clearly chaotic dynamics we get a k value of less than 0 0.003 away from 1 for an epsilon value of 0 0.2. So this test dealt very, very well with partial differential equations, which I want to highlight here. Okay, so now let's focus on noisy data. So as you can imagine, for real-world data, you get a fair amount of noise, especially in fluid dynamics. So the problem is noise is stochastic, like the gas particles we saw earlier. So if you're this test, which obviously we know is super sensitive, picks up noise, every single test is going to get a, um, a chaotic k value. So what you can actually do, and why this test is so useful for real, real world examples, is we can modify the mean squared displacement to account for the noise. So this s sub noise is our estimated value of noise, and we modify our mean squared displacement to account for the noise. And in the paper that this was studied in, about 80% of the time the, uh, the test correctly assessed whether or not the underlying dynamics were chaos. So basically this is Lorenz 96 model named for you know obviously Edward Lorenz and it is used for mid-latitude atmospheric dynamics so weather forecasting this would be extremely useful. So now let's go uh, over a few more examples of why using chaos and determining chaos could be useful in real-world applications. So you may remember predicting heart attacks is obviously very very incredible and also modeling disease spread. But what we can also do is now you can construct algorithms to model stock. So this is a fractal chaos bands method. And you know you can assess based on the previous um, ups and downs of stocks where you can you can estimate where the future value will go. And for weather predictions, obviously Edward Lorenz um, discovered chaos when he was working with weather modeling. And you may notice how two weeks out your weather forecast turns into accurate to not so accurate. So your weather forecast one month ago may just, it's just usually an estimate of your temperatures. But because it's so far away, small differences in the input values can lead to wildly large differences. Which is why as you get further and further out from the data forecast, the forecast becomes less and less accurate. So through understanding and um, better constructing models, you can actually improve weather forecasts. So to conclude, obviously what I've been trying to establish is how useful understanding chaos and detecting it can improve models, but the problem is it's difficult to know if a system is chaotic. Is it stochastic and completely random? Is it periodic, re uh, regular, or chaotic? And the zero one test is very, very easy to implement. It can be applied directly to the output of a system uh, where you don't know the underlying equation. You don't have to linearize your data, reconstruct phase space, which is why it has a vast number of real world applications. And Basically, you know, if you go into the original paper, you'll find 70 different papers on the bottom which apply the test to several real-world phenomenon. It can be as simple as um, analyzing bouncing ball dynamics for, you know, different substances, or as complicated as analyzing the uh, growth of stars in far-off galaxies. So basically, the zero-one test revolutionizes how we calculate chaos. It's extremely easy to implement, and there are so many real-world applications you can use it in. So I'd first like to acknowledge my professor for the course, Dr. Antonio Palacios. He's very, very helpful and helped, helped us get started on this topic. And I'd also like to thank my classmate, Carl Kaler, for all his help. So these are a list of our references. And if you're curious for more applications, you can go to the original paper. And there's actually about 70 different papers um, at the bottom with all the vast number of applications that have been performed with this test. So thanks for watching. You know, I really hope you enjoyed watching and um, hopefully this was interesting for you.